Hello everybody and welcome back to another video on chess or whatever. Today I have an amazing game for you. Really mind-blowing. I'm talking about the immortal Suxwang game played between Aaron Nimsevich and Friedrich Samisch, both two very strong grandmasters of the past. It was played in 1923 in Copenhagen. And this game is so famously good that it even has its own Wikipedia article. Wikipedia? 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 Wikipedia. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Whatever, I don't want to make this any longer than necessary. Let's go right into the game. Aaron Nemsovich is playing with the black pieces and Friedrich Samich with the white pieces. He starts with d4, knight to f6 and c4. We have a queen's gambit. After e6, Nimsovich is trying to play the Nimso Indian, named after Aaron Nimsovich and the country of India. If you would play knight to c6 and the bishop here, this would be the Nimso Indian defense. Now if you are playing an opponent and this opponent has an opening named after him, you probably don't want to play him in his opening. I mean, yeah, you, you, you understand what I mean? So, Samish, very wise, did not go into this. He played knight to f3. So, there is no Nimso Indian anymore. Uh, we have b6 and g3. They both fianchetto their bishop. They both develop more pieces and castle. So far, pretty standard stuff. We have this queen's gambit with the white bishop fianchetto sort of like in the Catalan, but the pawn structure is a little bit different. And black is playing this Queen's Indian setup. We have d5 stri striking in the center and knight to e5. This is a very, very strong knight here. Yeah, it controls a lot of enemy squares and it is itself well protected. So this knight, very strong. And from now on, every move, the computer just wants to get rid of the knight. Yeah, so it's really, really strong. We have c6 overprotecting the center. Yeah. White still takes, takes back, and the bishop goes to f4. And just, just to show you how much the computer actually wants to get rid of this, if we put on the engine, the computer just shows you different ways to get rid of the knight. So it really, really wants this knight gone. My nemesis. Your nemesis is a horse? But black plays a6 first. We have rook to c1 and b5, slowly getting more space on the queen side. The queen is coming out and now finally Nimsovich plays knight to c6, trying to trade off the knights. White trades it off and white plays h3. Now h3 is probably a bit too slow. Slow moving, inattentive, dull. And also it does not do that much, right? I mean, okay, it controls the g4 square, but what would black actually do with the g4 square? You can't, re you don't really want to put the knight here. Like, let's say uh, uh, white plays a different move. For example, putting the rook in the center, very reasonable, although the computer doesn't like it that much. I would never go here. You're not attacking anything. And if you play h3 now with tempo, I just have to go back. And now white's, white's better. So h3 at this position, I don't really understand. Now we have queen to d7, activating the queen more, and king to h2. King to h2 was for me a baffling move. Like h3, king h2, what's the point of all of this? So I actually asked on Reddit, on the chess subreddit, and surprisingly, I actually got good answers. So one of the people on Reddit said that it is a very principled way to get your king out of the back rank, to make sure those rooks have a bit more activity. And back then, when computers weren't a thing, you were playing way more on principles than you are nowadays. Still, king h2 isn't a good move, and it actually shows that white does not really have a plan here. And if we look at the position for a second, it uh, gets kind of obvious. I mean, what are you going to do with white? This bishop is activated, but it can't go anywhere where it is useful. Like it has one square, one single square. And I mean, what are you going to do here? You, you can't really go there, I take you, and either I win it for free or I ruin your pawn structure. 
And uh, same with this bishop. I mean, you can put it here, but what's it doing there? What? Why would you do this? This knight can't move. <laughs> I mean, it can move backwards. And funny enough, knights to b1 is the engine move. And the queen is very active, but where are you going to put it? Maybe activate the rook? But it's not that easy what you want to play as white. So black now plays knight to h5, attacking the bishop. White moves the bishop because the bishop pair is very valuable. And we have f5. Black is saying, dude, if you're not doing anything and you're just playing waiting moves, I don't have to do that. I'm going to attack you. So the queen moves back. And I said before that the queen isn't actually that bad on this square, which is true, but queen back to d1 has a very specific thought behind it. The problem is, it's not very good, and the thought behind it won't work. But I will show you that afterwards. The best move here, believe it or not, is again knight to b1. Now, why is knight to b1 good? There's a very simple reason, and I can show you this. If you move the queen, I play b4. You have to play knights to b1, and now this pawn is attacked once and protected once. So I can play whatever I want. But if you move back the knight to b1 now, because you have to move it anyways, and I play b4 trying to get more space, I can't do that because the pawn is attacked twice. So the thought here is that you don't want to allow your opponent to gain more space with tempo. Another way to prevent b4, of course, would be with a3. But the problem is, I just play a5 and now b4 is coming anyways. So knight to b1 would have been the best move here, but I mean, that's just insanely hard to see. I don't play Samish for not seeing that. He plays the queen to d1. We have b4, as I said, and knight to b1 anyways. Because the knight literally can't go anywhere, yeah. There, there are no other squares you get taken here. So knight to b1. Bishop to b5, activating the bishop even more. So we have rook to g1, and activating the bishop even further, bishop to d6. And now, white has a very interesting move. It's e4. And e4 was the point of putting the queen on d1. Because it's a discovered attack on the knight, and it tries to crack open black center. Why thought here that you can't just take the pawn and clamp down on this bishop even more because you take the knight? And it's even not that easy to protect the knight. You can't move it away because there's this pawn fork and you lose a piece. So you have to play g6, which just doesn't look really nice. You have this so-called Swiss cheese position here. The black squares are insanely weak. And I mean, after just something simple like bishop to h6, you have to move the rook away, I don't really know where, and pawn to e5, attacking the bishop, black has a really good control over these dark squares in black's position, and it's really unclear if black is still better. The problem with e4 is that you don't have to save the knight. Black sacrifices the knight by just letting it hang and plays f takes e4. White takes the knight, of course, which was the thought all along, and black plays rook takes f2. We have queen g5 and rook f8. The king moves back to h1, unpinning the pawn and unpinning the bishop. We have rook to f5 attacking the queen. Now the queen does not have that many squares to move to. In fact, the queen does not get taken immediately only on those three squares. Now let's have a look at them. If you move to h4, I play bishop to e7, you move the queen out of the way, bishop to e2, and your queen is trapped. If you move to g4 now, I play the same thing, just in the reverse order. I first play bishop to e2, then you move the queen, and then I play bishop to e7, and your queen is trapped again. But white moves his queen to e3. Now, black could still trap the queen with rook to e2. The queen only has one escape square, and after bishop to a4, white has to make this desperado with rook to c8 check. If you take the rook, it's a free rook, but I get the bishop and I still get to keep my queen. Now Nimsovich saw this 100%, but he decided to first play another move. He played bishop to d3, 
because now if I play rook to e2, there is no queen to b3 because the bishop is in the way. Very clever. So Samish defends it with rook to e1. And here we are finally at the amazing position I was talking about at the beginning of the video. It's black to move and black has a savage move. And this really fits in with a famous quote by Aaron Nimsevich. Nimsevich said, the threat is stronger than the execution. And he proved it with this next move, h6. h6 and white resigned. Why on earth is white resigning here? White is in so-called Sukswan. So every move you make just loses. H6 doesn't threaten anything. It's not attacking anything, there's no threat. But whatever white does, he just loses. So I'll, I will take you through this position, step by step, piece by piece, starting right to left, first with the pieces, then with the pawns. So first, the knight can't move, obviously. If it moves here, it just gets instantly taken. The bishop also can't move. If it moves here, it gets taken. The pawn is protected, of course, and if you move it back to c1, I take the knight, because the knight is now unprotected. Before it was protected by the rook, now it's not protected anymore. You can't move the queen anywhere. If you take, I take, all of those squares are protected, this square is protected, and there's no other way to move, yeah? The rook can't move either. Now it gets a little bit more complicated, but no matter where you move that rook, I play, as said before, Rook to e2, trapping the queen. Now this rook also can't move. If you move it here, I just take it. The bishop can't move. The bishop can't move here because I take it. Yeah, pawn takes. And if you move it here, we have to count attackers and defenders. You have two defenders and three attackers. All right, so none of those pieces can move. But what about the king? Well, if the king moves to h2, I have rook to f3. The bishop can't take me because it's pinned and the queen is trapped. So you also can't move the king. Now what about the pawns? Let's start with those pawns here. If you move this pawn up, I also play rook to f3. You might say, what? But now the bishop isn't pinned. Well, if bishop takes, I have rook to h2 checkmate. So you can't push this pawn. If you push this pawn, there's the next savage move. King to h8. Blacks just puts white and sucks one again. And you can't move the pawn twice because I take check. You have to intercept with the bishop and that's checkmate. So you can't move any of those pawns. What about this? Now, if you move this pawn, I just waste another move. h8. And if you play a3, I protect it with a5. If you take, I take back, and now white's in sucks one again. So you can't even waste moves. Now the most prolonging sequence would be a3, a5, a4, <laughs> king h8, wasting a move, b3, king g8, wasting a move, <laughs> h4, king h8, wasting another move, putting white in sucks one for the fourth move in a row. And now, to say it in Aaron Nimsewicz's own words, White must willy-nilly eventually throw himself up on the sword. So that's why White resigned after h6, just to show you the final position again. We had rook to e1, h6, White resigns, despite having 27 possible moves. 27. Amazing. I don't think it gets any better than that. I really hope you enjoyed this game as much as I did. If you liked the video, like the video, feel free to leave a sub, and I hopefully see you again in the next week for a video on chess or whatever.